afternoon. Thank you for joining us. We're sorry we're a little late. Technology has not been my friend today. So first thing, if you haven't signed in, please make sure you sign in on your way out. Uh, we use this to prove to the county that we're valuable. So please make sure that you help us in that. Surveys. We have a survey to kind of find out more about you, our guests, as well as to find out if you're more interested in us doing other programs. Maybe you have an idea for a program we haven't thought of. Uh, we had one last week, somebody suggested say Sautel. Great idea. They didn't tell us who to have speak. Um, support us. Uh, we are a nonprofit, so we rely on your memberships and your donations to fund our projects. So if you're not a member, consider taking out a membership form. We have a membership, taking out a membership. We have membership forms over by Tabitha or if you can't find one, ask, we'll be glad to get you one. If you're just interested in making a donation, the donation jar is over by the refreshments, which is my next topic, refreshments. Make sure you grab some. And silence your cell phones, please. They're recording this, and it's really kind of, um, my word is going to be rude, <laughs> to have your cell phone go off in the middle of a program, unless, I mean, obviously, in case of severe emergency, but you can also set it to vibrate. So our speaker today is Dr. Scott Miranda, who has a PhD from the University of Wisconsin and is a modern environmental historian and author of The People's Own Landscape, Nature, Tourism, and Dictatorship in East Germany, Social History, Popular Culture, and Politics in Germany. He has been involved in many field experiences in the Adirondacks and has taken students from his environmental history course to explore the politics and the history of this region. His current research touches, in part, on the attempted introduction of German scientific forestry to the Adirondacks. In 2016, he consulted on the PBS documentary about Carl Schenk, an early American forester, talking about the German influence on early American forestry. For the last few years, Dr. Miranda has brought his students from his class here to Cortland County Historical Society to learn more about our research center, as well as to research environmental topics with local ties like Cortland line and fly fishing and especially Lime Hollow, which is the subject today. Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your patience. <laughs> Apparently we were just too speedy for the computer. <laughs> um, so I've been, the last few years, using Lime Hollow as a laboratory for my history students to practice historical research and to think about environmental history, how uh, Society, our society has used the land differently over the years, from decade to decade, and what impact that has had on the land. And it's not just about what happens to the deer and the, and the blue jays, it's also what happens to people. Um, how farmers struggle when, uh, because of erosion or how soil fertility declines because of environmental changes uh, re re related to deforestation and other things. So, and Lime Hall is really cool because in many ways, you can tell the environmental history of the U.S. using that one place. Um, the history of conservation it is really important in New York State conservation. You have major figures um, such as Osborne from over in Auburn, who was a uh, co conservation commissioner. Um, and he even connects to Lime Hollow in some ways. Um, both state attempts to preserve the environment, but also private efforts by local hunters to preserve the environment. So that story I'm not going to tell today, but it, it's also there. Um, the story of dairy agriculture and modernization of this area could be told at Lime Hollow. I'm going to focus on early industry um, and uh, you and think about William Gracie in a slightly different way. How many of you have heard of William Gracie? I figured most of you would. And I decided, you know, I'll talk about industry and environment um, through his story because you're probably familiar with it. We mostly know that he was kind of a kook um, <laughs> who just happened to own a lot of land around here. Uh, he thought he was the heir to the British throne um, and uh, made quite a big deal about this. And I'll say more about his story in a minute. Uh, but he was an, uh, owned an early sawmill in the area. Um, so he was a part of the deforestation. He was a part of the exploitation of local resources. Um, so what's the story of industry in Hollow? Um, so first of all, environmental history, I basically already defined it. Um, just, not just environmentalism conservation, but also economic history, uh, farming history, agricultural history, how um, are, how is ecology being shaped for different reasons. 
Um, in my research, I have students combine uh, non-textual aerial photographs, LIDAR, which is a kind of radar mapping, as well as textual resources that have been digitized. The digital revolution is key to better telling local history, I think. Um, now we can full text search old newspapers and not have to spend years thumbing through every page looking for William Gracie, Gracie's name or looking for the word sawmill. You just do a full text search. Uh, property deeds um, have been digitized and put online here in Cortland County. In fact, I think we're the only county in the state that has every property deed digitized and online and and you can search by name of the property owners. Other state, other counties have maybe 50 years or 30 years of those property deeds online. Uh, we're lucky here. Yep. Um, so Lime Hollow, most of you know where it is. It is uh, between McLean Road and Highway 13 in uh, this region. Um, here's Gracie Road. Um, this is an aerial photograph from today. Um, I just want to, I'm not going to talk about all of this industry, but this is a map that I put together very quickly of mills or other sites of work or industry in the Beaverbrook watershed or uh, in the near the Beaverbrook watershed. So Beaverbrook is, starts up uh, in Lime Hollow and runs toward McLean and meets Fall Creek there. So you had uh, sawmill and gristmill and cheese factory over near Walmart today up on the hill above Walmart um, in South Cortland, Cooper shop, blacksmith shops. You had a gristmill down near the rest area on Highway 13 um, today. Uh, a rake factory was there. And then in Lime Hollow itself, you had two sawmills. Uh, and I will zoom in in a second and show you there's a couple other sites. Um, Gracie's Mill. Uh, it's located sort of in the middle of the preserve, and it's not on Gracie Pond. If you are a hiker who goes to Lime Hollow, or you, Gracie Pond is the big pond right there near the visitor center. That uh, had nothing to do with Gracie's sawmill at the time. That was a different sawmill. Um, this is what we call Gracie Pond today. Um, and around it, uh, the Chapins, who I'd love to tell their story on a different day. I don't have time today. Um, one of the Chapins ends up moving down to South Carolina and becoming a big sawmill owner down there, owns slaves to help work his factory. But he's got to start here mm -hmm. um, in, in a sawmill. But he built this pond in 1836, ended up having to buy a neighbor's land because he accidentally flooded it when he built the dam. <laughs> and all of this, how do I know this from property deeds? Um, you, know, you can see little details about actual changes to the land just in property deeds. He built a churn factory. Um, uh, Cortland County was big for making butter churns, including dog-powered butter churns. Uh, uh, but so we had a churn factory here, a cider mill. Uh, and if you look at the old town records when they were building roads in this region, uh, this road, Gracie Road, originally was basically built to go to the sawmill and to the <coughs> cider mill. Uh, the sawmill, Chapman Sawmill, eventually became the creamery, um, and a railroad station was established near, near it. Um, this is an 1876 map of uh, zoomed in on the Lime Hollow area. You can see a sawmill here. This is that Chapman mill, not the Gracie mill, which does not show up on the map. It's, it's disappeared by 1876. Um, just I will quickly move this and move on and get to uh, Gracie. But Chapman was an innovator and inventor. Um, uh, before he moved down to South Carolina, he was uh, a local salesman selling a fancy new water wheel for sawmills and others. And according to this advertisement, the Cortland, uh, I think it's no, the Cortland Democrat, um, uh, this water wheel he sold to the churn factory that his son, his brother operated, um, but also four or five other mills in the county would, would use this water wheel that he was selling. Um, here's an advertisement in the Cortland Democrat for the churn that was being made at Lime Hollow. Uh, at the churn factory, which uh, there's no longer a building there today. Um, so William Gracie, in case you didn't know, made quite a name for himself. This is his obituary, which appears in the London Times. Um, why did the London Times <coughs> care about little old William Gracie? Because he claimed um, to be the heir to the British throne. Um, <laughs> which sounds kind of fun and neat, but it turns out Gracie was, it was more than just delusional. He was also a little paranoid, because he also thought the British throne was threatened by him and had secret agents out to kill him. So he carried, had a gun under his pillow at all times, and he um, 
ended up going to a trial in 1843 in Manhattan, um, which made the New York Herald over six different issues with kind of a blow-by-blow -blow account of this trial. Um, and I found this in the Library of Congress's uh, digitized newspapers, um, in which uh, Gracie accused two men of uh, conspiring against him, and they in turn accused him of being insane, and so there was this kind of <laughs> long trial to establish, A, whether Gracie was sane or not, um, and whether or not these guys were actually conspiring to kill Gracie and or rob him of his money, to, to blackmail him of his money. Um, this uh, section of the trial report in the New York Herald is really fun because one of the uh, wealthy leaders of Brooklyn is on the stand and he basically says, you know, Gracie's a good nature, he's a good guy, except for this one thing, this one obsession he has with being the heir to the British throne. <laughs> Uh, and he recommends to Gracie um, that he hopes a complete restoration <coughs> to his family, um, uh, that he would get over this conspiracy theory, and he recommended to him to seek and travel uh, that uh, repose and change of life and thought which would most effectively contribute to his recovery as he was established his health and withdraw him from the hands of the designing men among whom he very much feared he had now fallen. So basically, Go to Europe or the Caribbean and get over yourself. If he doesn't go to Europe, he comes to Portland. Um, so the Gracies, his father uh, was a shipper uh, based in Jamaica on Long Island, um, and he traded in goods with the Caribbean. Um, he may have been, and I don't know at this point, we may never know, he may have also been trading in slaves at, at some point. Uh, but he was certainly trading in goods grown by slaves uh, between Long Island and the Caribbean. And he made quite a lot of money, um, and whatever poor soldier on the Sullivan campaign who won uh, Lot 91 here in Cortland County on the military tract um, decided not to move to the wilderness and instead sold his lot, uh, his 600 acres, um, and it ended up being exchanged as payment. So basically, Gracie got it after five other rich guys had it. And they basically would say, hey, I'll sell you a boat for that 600 acres up in Cortland. So it, it's, this piece of land is changing hands, even as all around it, farmers and settlers are arriving in Cortland and beginning to establish farms. So it's kind of an interesting plot of land that remains forest, so-called virgin forest much longer than the rest of the surrounding Cortland area, which is already by 1840 um, has lots of farms and it is beginning um, to develop. Um, and that'll be an important part of the story in a moment. Um, Archibald Grazie, before he died, sold the land to his wife um, for $1,000, I believe, yes, $1,000. I believe that Gracie had brought such shame on his family because of his, his, his delusions, but also he left his wife. Um, he went bankrupt, uh, bankrupted his family because he, in addition to his delusions, he also had a bad habit of uh, making lots of investments that didn't pan out. Um, and it seems, based on how much he paid his mother for this land, um, he paid $6,000 for something she bought from her husband for $1,000 just 20 years earlier. My guess is this is a payoff to support his wife, who continues to live with his mother in Jamaica. Um, and, uh, and it also gives Gracie something to do because he is really doesn't want to show, his family doesn't want him to show his face in New York City too much. So he's got this land. Um, I didn't pull up the image today. He first shows up in Cortland, if you look at the register of the Cortland, Ho Cortland Hotel, uh, which is, maybe getting the name wrong, but it, the register is here in the Historical Society. He first shows up in Cortland around 1846, and it says that his destination is McLean. Basically, he's going toward McLean to where Lyme Hollow is to check out this land that he now owns. Mm -hmm. Were they Danish? The Gracies? The uh, Scottish. Uh, this is the 1860 industrial census um, showing uh, William Gracie's sawmill. Um, so by 1860, he has a mill. I believe he probably established it sometime in 1850, 
Um, it doesn't show up in the 1855 state census, but it does show up here in the 1860 census. That's a sawmill for making boards and planks. Um, it shows that he's using 2,500 hemlock trees, 1,000 pine logs, um, 400 something uh, logs of hardwood to make board, plank, and then something which is really hard to read, scantling, um, which was often used um, as the runners for plank roads in the 1850s, hmm. 1860s. Um, so given that basically he's producing plank and scantling, um, I can't prove this, um, but the Homer Plank Road, uh, if you look at the minutes, which are at the Syracuse Special Collections, um, they, they talk about in 1850 that they've got a pretty good deal on hardwood. Um, a lot of plank roads at this point were giving up on hardwood because it was too expensive, and we're using pine or hemlock to build their roads. But they're, they, they're talking about, hey, we have a pretty good deal here. They don't mention who is providing it, that deal. Um, uh, but they, they have a contract for hardwood and hemlock uh, and, uh, in 1850, and then they also in 1860, you see them purchasing another 25,000 foot uh, plank. Mm -hmm. Given that he was producing scantling and plank, and given that uh, much of the woodland around here had already been removed by 1850, um, often for potash, trees were just burnt down and sent to asheries and then sold as potash. Um, or cleared for farmland. This would be a large 500 acre section of woodland available um, to provide fairly inexpensive lumber instead of having to buy expensive hardwood from several counties away um, that would have cost more. So my theory, my hypothesis is that in fact uh, Gracie's Mill, um, and maybe not just Gracie's Mill, but Gracie's Mill partly was providing its lumber to build the plank road that ran from Cortland to Sarah, uh, all through Homer um, and on to uh, Syracuse in the 1850s. Uh, in a 1911 Syracuse uh, <coughs> Herald uh, newspaper, uh, the Cortland County historian uh, wrote an article about Gracie. Um, it gets a few things wrong. So uh, how many of you know about the, uh, the mayor's mansion in New York City? Uh, anyone know its name? Gracie Mansion. Gracie Mansion. Um, in this article, it suggests that Gracie Mansion, that is the Gracies of William Gracie and Corland. Um, it's an honest mistake. There happen to be two William R. Gracies living at the same time in New York City. One in Jamaica, one in Manhattan. They're not related. Um, so the Gracie of uh, Corland was not related uh, to the Gracie Mansion of New York City. Um, but there's a lot of cool things in this article. Um, Otherwise, there's a picture, and I have no idea where this picture is today, if it still exists. The picture is supposedly of Gracie's Mill. Um, there's two buildings uh, here. And if you wander around off trail in Lime Hollow, you can find that site. There's a lot of rock on the ground, stone, and it, there's one little metal piece sticking out of the ground um, that probably was hold, helping hold up the water wheel on that mill. Um, and I, have a picture, but I couldn't find it this morning, so I don't have that the picture of a piece of metal. It's just a piece of metal. <laughs> um, in this article, it suggests that the mill has long disappeared by 1911, um, that uh, the stream that powered the mill uh, in a large storm basically changed course, and there no longer was any water to power the mill. Um, the stream, Beaver Brook, which is in Lime Hollow Preserve today, may have changed course, uh, but actually what had happened is that the, there was no longer a mill owner to maintain the infrastructure to supply water to this mill. Um, so it wasn't a natural disaster as much as a lack of maintenance that meant there was no longer water running to this mill. I mean, if you go to this mill today, there's no water running by it. You might wonder, how did he power the sawmill? There's no running water anywhere near this mill. Um, so, my first got here 11 years ago, I often went hiking in Lom Hollow, and I kept, you know, I was wandering down the trails, and I would notice these straight lines that didn't look very natural. So it started, first got me thinking, there's something here, uh, maybe uh, uh, aqueduct or a canal. So this is an aerial photo from 1936. Um, this is a LiDAR image. LiDAR is planes fly over, and they, they shoot a lot of radar on the ground, it bounces back, and they can, uh, you can, you take that data, take the trees out of it, and you can just get the bare earth terrain. So you can often see old stone walls from the 1880s, 1860s. 
um, that you wouldn't be able to see because they're on private property under a tree canopy. Um, but with LIDAR, you can see those old stone walls and other structures on them. Um, so what we're looking at here um, is, so here is where Beaver Brook runs today. Um, this here, if you take the um, uh, Finway Trail at Lime Hollow, it kind of travels along here. Um, and then down this way, and there's a little, this kind of open area with no trees. Um, that was Gracie's mill pond. Um, and essentially he built a dam here. Um, and then from the brook, which was north of the mill pond, he dug a ditch. And you could still see it vaguely in 1936 in this aerial photograph, because there were no trees. There are now. Um, and you can see it in the LIDAR as a depression that looks um, very straight and doesn't my, I would argue it looks very clearly um, dug by somebody. Um, so he dug this trench from the brook to divert water down to his mill pond, but the sawmill wasn't here. Um, he then, or his employees, then dug, um, this is hard to read, but here's the mill pond. Here's that ditch from the brook. Here is Beaver Brook. He then dug a aqueduct or a dike, as in the property deeds call it a dike, to run the water along the contour of the land all the way down to here, which is where you would find a sawmill. Now, you can imagine it would, it would really take maybe an insane rich guy to do this. Because <laughs> um, he's not just building a, a dam, he's building a dike, a dam, a canal, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this is all being done with horsepower and manpower. And how many linear feet is that, Scott? Um, that's a good question. And it's it's roughly quarter to a half mile from here to here. So over a thousand feet. Yeah, over a thousand feet. Um, and if you want to email me later, I can give you the exact amount. Mm -hmm. But I have some pictures too. So this is that aqueduct. So this <laughs> is the Fidway Trail. Um, and it, so you can still see it today. It's washed out at points. So whatever water is running through it, instead of continuing all the way down the aqueduct to where the mill would have been, you know, it's broken through and now runs back to the, to the brook from there. Um, this is a little harder to see, but there's a depression here. This is that uh, ditch from uh, above the mill pond, north of the mill pond, that ran water from Beaver Brook um, down to the mill. Um, and this I never would have noticed, except for I saw the aerial photograph, I saw the LIDAR, and I said, hmm. and I kept wondering, how did you get water here? Um, so one day I went bushwhacking, and I, I may have trespassed on some private property uh, <laughs> on, the, on the edge of Lime Hollow, um, and found this, uh, this structure. Uh, how, he's logging um, in the middle of a forest and on the edge of a swamp that's not actually near a major road. Highway 13, you have um, the McLean Road, and his house is actually on McLean Road. Um, so he had to have a built a road, and the other cool thing, if you look closely, and if you know where to look in Lime Hall today, you can find traces of that old um, logging road today. Um, it, um, this is a 1936 photograph again. The mill is down here. You can kind of see a depression here if you, if you look really closely. Um, have a, some other evidence around you. There's mention in the deeds of a logging road, which is why I started looking for it and wondering where it was. Um, and it runs north. Here's Lehigh Valley Railroad. Uh, here is where Baldwin Pond is today. Another cool story. Not a beaver pond. Actually built by the DEC and the Soil Water Conservation District as a wildlife refuge in the 1950s. Um, the road, from what I could tell, ran kind of the bottom of this hill. Um, this is a later road from 1955, but then it ran up to where Gracie's house was, and this is the McLean Road. You can see traces of that logging road here today um, uh, and a couple other spots. Um, and one thing I hope to do with this story, but also with all the other industry and the churn factory, is to put together a uh, tour, a historical tour of Lime mm Hollow. -hmm where you would have, probably not signs, I'm hoping to actually use an app where you'd have, you could use GPS and it would tell you 
when you're in the middle of nowhere, hey, <laughs> there used to be a mill here, or hey, there used to be um, a logging road here, because you wouldn't necessarily notice it if you weren't looking for it. Um, so for my students, for myself, uh, I'm not just interested in Gracie as this loony guy who does funny things and makes a name for Portland. Uh, I'm also not just interested in um, his business, but also what does this mean for the land? And Gracie along is, has one mill of dozens of mills in Cortland, hundreds of mills in Cortland County in the mid 19th century. Um, this is a lease um, found in the property deeds, and it specifically tells the leasee, hey, don't use the hemlock. What does that tell me? That tells me Gracie cared about the hemlock. He was making money off of it. He was selling it. So that's another piece of evidence. So what was he cutting down? Um, so how did the original native forest change over time? Well, here's a little piece of evidence. That the hemlock um, was being taken either for uh, tanneries, for bark, um, for tanneries, or for shingles, for roofs, or for scantling to build plank roads. Um, and whatever it was being used for, Gracie, this is where he's going to make his money. <coughs> the guy who's going to be living on his land can't use it for firewood or anything else. Uh, there's another lease um, that also mentions that uh, the leasee can collect firewood, but he has to get permission from Gracie because he, he can't, and he cannot cut down trees for firewood. He has to, he can only collect whatever debris is on the ground. So again, it tells us those trees that are standing are, are valuable to the landowner because he did, he was milling it and, and trying to make, pay off his debts. Um, if you look at the court records, Gracie at least four, four times shows up in court because he can't pay off debts to some local, <coughs> local person here in Portland. So he's continuing that same problem that he had back in New York City. Um, there's another um, deed I don't, I'm not showing you today that mentions that a later landowner or leasee one of their jobs to help pay for their rent was to clear scrub. And what happens when you cut down virgin forest is that it quickly is replaced by thorny um, scrub, especially if you're grazing cattle on it. So you have lots of hawthorn and other uh, kind of unpleasant little short trees. So basically, you get the sense that Gracie came in in 1850, and within 15 years, it pretty much cleared uh, Lot 91 most of his trees. Probably not in the swamplands of, um, to the south of, uh, in parts of Lime Hollow, but uh, a lot of it had been clear and it was quickly being overrun, um, helped by grazing cattle with this thorny scrub. Um, and it was kind of becoming this wasteland uh, in the area. Eventually, in part to pay off his debts, Gracie would sell this land to farmers. And these would have been desperate farmers because as uh, the Baldwin family, who lived there later, uh, and originally came here to work in Gracie's Mill, and eventually became quite famous as uh, working in the dairy industry and in, in government in Albany. The Baldwins, um, in one of their interviews in the Cortland Standard, said, you were farming rocks more than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the people who bought this on Gracie uh, were not wealthy farmers who could afford the prime farmland in Homer. These were people who came in later and were just looking for any plot of land they could get. This is a picture taken at Le on the Lehigh Valley Railroad. Um, just beyond this hill is where Gracie Pond is today. Gracie Station would have been just through this, uh, around this bend. If you've been on the Lehigh Valley Trail in Lime Hollow, you know this is a thick woodland uh, with 40 foot trees overhead, um, the full canopy. This is 1900, um, so this is just over 100 years ago. Um, there were barely any trees in what is today Lime Hollow, which is a, you know, that's not a wilderness when you go visit it. You're visiting a wounded landscape that's recovering. Uh, and it's recovering, not necessarily as nature intended, it's recovering in ways that were, are shaped by what humans did here. Uh, this is a pond now, because basically the culverts under the railroad were no longer maintained, but it was abandoned. So now the railroad is a dam that's damming up water in Lime Hollow. Um, so what humans put on the land, hundreds, probably for the next 200 years, are going to shape the ecology of that space. So history matters for ecology as well. 
Um, 1930s, this is 1936, an aerial, uh, a lot of this land that Gracie had been uh, lumbering uh, was used as grasslands, as pasture. Um, and the CCC and local hunters worked to reforest it in the 1930s. So in 1955, you can see there's been a lot of recovery. Um, so that photo with no trees would not, could not have been taken 20 years later. Um, so it's big takeaways from this. Um, I think this, we could tell the story of William Gracie not just as a story of an individual, um, but as part of a story of capitalism, um, part of the story of speculation, um, and the story of wealth inequality in this country. So here's a guy from a wealthy family, super rich, but despite the fact that he's constantly in debt, constantly bankrupt, he is accused of being insane, Unlike someone who may have been from a lower middle class family, a working class family, he's not put away in an asylum. Right? He has enough money that he, you know, he can, people are going to kind of push him to the side and he can keep on trying. Right? Um, he, it, despite the fact that he doesn't really do much work and just loses money, <laughs> uh, benefits from his family's land in upstate New York, uh, moves up here. Um, and could continue his business. Um, and he continued to make a certain amount of money. He was known for riding his beautiful white horses up and down the Homer Plank Road. <laughs> Another clue, maybe, that you know, he was very proud of that road. Maybe his timber went, went to it. Um, and he became, he saw himself as a local aristocrat, who, you know, noblesse oblige, he was going to help um, the poor of Cortland. He was very loved by the poor farmers in his vicinity. Uh, but this guy, has been able to continue doing what he does because his family made a lot of money because of slavery, because of capitalism, because of uh, transatlantic uh, trade. It also is an interesting story of what land speculation means uh, <coughs> for the environment. Uh, it's not soldiers who often showed up in this area to farm. It's the guys they sold the land to, and then those guys sold you know, the rich guys who got the land sold it at as high a price as possible to potential settlers in the region. Okay. Um, so even though Lime Hollow is not good farmland, you know, some guys who made their money in shipping invested in that money and waited and you know, eventually there was such a shortage of land that they could make a decent amount selling. But only when they had mined, stripped the land of its resources, of its timber. Once you'd done that, Sold, paid off your debts, then you sell it to some poor sap from Delaware County or from Massachusetts who uh, is desperate for a piece of land. Um, I mean, the consequences of that uh, wealth inequality, uh, that desperation of those poor farmers, and of that la uh, the land mining by these rich speculators is the flooding of the 1920s and 1930s. It is uh, rapid deforestation and decline of soil fertility. Area. And William Gracie is a, is a part of that story. Um, so I'll stop there. I just want to say that um, look for more stories of the history of Lime Hollow and of the Trout Brook watershed in Salon and McGraw, which is another project I've had students working on uh, uh, that we can enrich our history of Portland County, not just the history of colleges and industries and farming, but also the history of um, the environment and places that don't have museums, where buildings don't exist, they have, you know, we can start telling those histories using aerial photographs, mm -hmm. LIDAR, mm -hmm. um, property deeds, and other non-traditional um, sources. Those stories can also be told. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any questions? Is the Gracie Depot Chicago? Yes. Oh. Yeah, it was originally called Chicago, and then you know, the local small farmers who, some of them had worked for Gracie, um, some of them owned, bought land from him, I guess to honor him, they liked him. Um, he was a funny little guy. Um, they named, they renamed the station from Chicago to Gracie. Um, renamed, okay. Yeah, so it was Chicago uh, and it became uh, Gracie. Mm -hmm. and Gracie Road was named after him, Gracie Pond, uh, even though that wasn't his mill pond.
why did he, I'm going to miss that, why did he think he was the rightful heir to the British throne? Um, his family was Scottish, so he, I don't know if his father told him the story or he, or where it was family legend probably, uh, that he was from, of the Stuarts, um, mm -hmm. and that through the Stuarts, um, he supposedly, his family uh, should have gained the throne. So this has to do with Mary Queen of Scots. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm not an expert in, I, I, I can't tell you more than that, but yeah, that's why he thought. Uh, his family, his father, I believe, immigrated from Scotland to the U.S. So there are some false Yep. Yeah, um, that was the first time in New York they did it. Uh, aerial photographs only became common beginning in the 1930s. And it has a lot to do with the New Deal. Uh, the USDA, uh, other organizations that are looking to deal with flooding and erosion and unemployment, aerial photographs are a useful tool uh, for those projects. And so they first start in the 1930s. And it's typically government organizations that were created in the 30s that continue to take those photographs. So we have, if you go to Cornell, if you Google Cornell aerial photographs, um, there's a really great website that has central New York aerial photographs from 36, 54, 55, 66, and in some counties, 1981 as well. And they're really interesting if you're, if you're a history buff. Um, seeing, it could be how the town of Cortland changed, but also how the countryside has changed um, over a period of 50, 60 years. So since the airplane was it invited right to 1910, yeah. were they taken with a balloon? Uh, 1936, so they were using airplanes. Oh, 1936. 36. When was the Adirondack Park established that they probably would have done aerial things up here too? It's a huge, it was established in a uh, huge amount of land. The 1870s and 80s. So, you know, when we talk about forest and environment in this state, we talk about the Catskills, we talk about the Adirondacks. Um, and you saw a little bit of this in my last presentation. Mm -hmm. There's a third major area of forest that we never talk about, and that is central New York. Uh, and, that, and the reason we don't talk about it is because it used to be farmland in 1890. It was all abandoned. People moved west. They stopped paying their taxes. And in the beginning of the 1920s, when FDR was governor, um, the state began to purchase that abandoned farmland. And in the 19, but even before the New Deal, um, the state of New York began to plant trees. And then, of course, once you had the New Deal and the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, you now have cheap labor mm -hmm. to plant trees. Because you can't pay someone very much to plant a tree. It's, <laughs> um, it's not high skilled labor. Um, so it's hard to find someone to do it. And uh, so the CCC does it. So in the 1920s and 30s, um, whether it's Chenango, Cortland, the first state forest on abandoned farmland in the entire state, and possibly the entire country, was in Cortland County, up in Scott. Um, it was first replanted by the Cortland County Sportsman Association. Um, and uh, Kennedy of Kennedy Forest, uh, the state forester, uh, the fiddle player, um, who was the head of the Sportsman Association, McDermott, Mm -hmm. um, those two guys, even before the FDR and New Deal happened, those guys were spending their own money, raising money, and having school kids, 4-H kids, hunters plant trees in Cortland County. It was really a grassroots effort. Uh, but again, in the 1930s, later, the state began to start spending money to plant trees. So, but Cortland is um, the beginning of that story. And Chenango, Madison County, Cortland County, uh, if you look at where the state forests are today, there's the Adirondacks. Catskills, and there's a splotch in central and western New York. And that story is a part of Cortland's story, which we, uh, we, we could t t tell that story a little bit more loudly, I think. You mentioned we, Scott. We is that why probably that Memorial Boulder is in a long road between 41 and Scott? There's a fork in the road, it, yeah, and there's a huge boulder, and I stopped mm -hmm. 15 or 20 years ago, and it, oh, CCC. Yeah. So I know the Shanine one, but there's one up there. And, the, so before, uh, the CCC might have helped out later, but that near there is it's what, what was called State <laughs> Reforestation, Area, Reforestation Area Number One, okay. because it was the first one. Might be too. Um, and Osborne, the Conservation Commissioner, Morgenthau, Henry Morgenthau Jr., who was the head of conservation later, or before Osborne, um, 
I don't know if FDR came, but uh, lots of dignitaries, uh, some of the foresters from Cornell, they all showed up in 19, 26 or 29, um, and dug some dirt, <laughs> planted some trees, and had a big ceremony. This, this was the first attempt by a government to fix abandoned farmland. Uh, up in Scotland. So there's deforestation. People realize that there's runoff. Where is the evidence of that runoff? So much so that people started planting trees. There were devastating floods in this county. Not the big one's 1935, but um, 1902, 1917, um, and this is happening all throughout um, central and western New York. Uh, and scientists have, have been. And geographers and geologists have been making this argument for 50, 60 years by this point, by 1930, that if there's no trees to stop the runoff and absorb the water, it's going gonna, it's gonna to rush down the stream and cause flooding of this. Mm -hmm. um, and even in the 1870s, locals blamed the failure of a lot of saw and grist mills. They blamed it on the drying up of streams. Why, would, why were streams drying up? Because there was a forest cover. Um, so snow melt, melted more, qu more quickly. You didn't have um, a high water table anymore, and mills dry, supposedly dried up. Mm -hmm. There are other reasons those mills went out of business, but th there's some truth to that. Mm -hmm. So um, by 1920, there had been a 50-year discussion about the effect of deforestation um, on the environment, but also on the economy. Because one reason the economy was in such a mess up here is because no one you had this abandoned farmland, no one's paying taxes on it. So it's a drain on local mm -hmm. um, governments. Um, so they're trying to figure out what to do with it. And it's not good farmland, so they're not going to they're not going to attract immigrants to farm it. So what else are you going to do with it? Um, and one thing. Well, and originally the idea is you would plant trees and harvest them later, and that would be a source of income for the state. It didn't. Most of the time, it didn't happen. Though, though there is some harvesting of timber. So where did the topsoil go? Chesapeake, I, I'm, Chesapeake Bay. Oh, wonderful. Okay, <laughs> it traveled a long way. Well, a lot of it went into those old mill ponds. Um, okay, and filled them up. Filled them up. Yeah. And then eventually, it would leave those when mm -hmm. the mills no longer were there. Mm -hmm. The dams were not maintained. Mm -hmm. And it's um, going again this year because I've never seen the Tiafno Oga River this time of year. Look, it's, it looks like the Chocolate River in southern mm -hmm. Texas now. Yeah. It runs mm -hmm. just like Bottoms are scoured. Yeah. And the ravines and uh, along the, the way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and flooding rates did go down once we reforested. Um, and that's my other project, uh, the report I've been writing this week um, that I'll present in some other video and some other, maybe in McGraw. Um, the flooding did go down after that. Um, but there's still sediment be running well, for other reasons. And we've, we've, you look around now, there's trees on every hilltop. Right. That wasn't true before. So there must be other reasons we still have sediment problems in our, in our rivers. Scott, was the lumber being exported south, north, west, east from here? Unfortunately, most of it wasn't even being exported. So it wasn't getting on a railroad and going? It, it w most of that was cut down before 1850. And it was not easy to get timber to New York City, to Baltimore. Mm -hmm. uh, but it wasn't very reliable. I mean, you look, if you go into buildings on Main Street or some of the old houses in the community, you'll find 3 by 12 3 by 14 virgin hemlock full span 28 foot long uh, timber on, on two foot centers down on Main Street. Mm -hmm. So the sawmills that were cutting timber, it went to plank roads, it went to local buildings, uh, but most of the trees around here were um, cut down, gathered in piles, and set on fire. Really? Because mm -hmm. uh, that was the easiest way to clear land. And char charcoal or just potash? Just to, ter to sell as potash. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, and there was a market for potash. The British were desperate for fertilizer because mm -hmm. um, their soil had been farming for centuries and uh, guano was expensive and so you know, they also bought potash. That's a whole new industry now, the guano industry, you know that, for marijuana. Again, okay. uh, yeah. But potash was also used for munitions, uh, for making <coughs> weapons, for bombs. So um, mm -hmm. um, that was another reason the British were buying it. But down in Pennsylvania, um, the Pennsylvania Dutch, the farmers in Maryland were also buying that potash to fertilize their, their pastures and their, their alfalfa and their, their crops. It's like when I did my wagon research, most of the wagon companies <coughs> had to buy lumber mills in the south mm -hmm. to supply the wood to make the wagons. Yeah, mm -hmm. What wood was here was expensive because it was a scarce commodity by that mm -hmm. um, But most of it, most of it wasn't even used as lumber. 
most of the, like I said, it was, it was just burnt. And because landowners wanted to farm. That was their priority, and they needed to clear land as quickly as possible. And the quickest way was to burn it. Plus, you could make some extra cash. I saw the name Shummerhorn in there for the Plank Road stuff. Is that the big house on Main Street and Homer the Tree now where the require was before? Is that I don't know, but it is, it is a local wealthy family. Right. A leading family. The Randalls, the Shummerhorns, the, and a couple others were on the board of the Plank Road company. Mm -hmm. And those, those minutes are in Syracuse at the, at the university. How, how do we get more of this, not in the academic hands of researchers like yourself, but in the hands of local admin, you know, administrators and educators to teach our children that there's some real important local history in the formation of the United States that we seem to just forget about. Um, Which is probably a whole other topic on itself. Yeah, I mean, it's having time to do the research and the writing. Um, but, you know, our student Cortland in the history department, we recently hired a public historian. And one of his jobs is to tell these local stories, and, and should, which should lead to oral interviews, video recordings, it should lead to websites, it should lead to public I mean, McGraw has the New York Central College, Homer yeah. has Carpenter, DeVoe, yeah. and Stoddard from, from Lincoln, and we just have these wonderful, and Bloomer and whatnot, and Sperry from Cortland that lived here for a while, beyond the Wickwires and the Brewers and the other yes. industrials in town, and, and we're, we're not teaching our children any of this local history. Well, if we give more money to the Soviet Society in 1890, that would help. It happens. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's tough because um, you remember professional historians <laughs> who have the research skills and who are teaching students. Uh, I mean, there's lots of other historians who are doing good work, but the, the folks at the, the folks at the college, they're so spe we, we are so special. I'm a German historian. It's basically the generosity with my time that I do this, and because I also want my students to get hands-on experience, and they don't know German. So if I want them to do environmental history, uh, it's going to have to be local. Um, but I've also invested a lot of my weekends because uh, it's fun. Tramping around. Tramping around or, or coming here. Um, uh, and hopefully other uh, people up at the colleges uh, will do that as well. And I think, but having a public historian who's actively getting students to do these local histories, I think it should help. We should start, hopefully, mm -hmm. see more of it. We have the DVD on New York Central College. Mm -hmm. It's at the Smithsonian now, mm -hmm. so we're trying to get that out. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and hopefully, you know, I, I, the more I tell about these different types of sources, mm -hmm. those of you in this room might start using them as would, well. Would you be comfortable mm -hmm. giving it? Peter's with the Cortland Voice. Would you be interested in doing a, uh, he, he is the Cortland Voice, Peter Blanchard. <laughs> would you be interested in doing a, uh, an interview with him at some point in the future? Yeah. Love mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Any, any other questions? In your research, did you ever come across any farmers from the years you're talking about that did do anything to conserve their land? Or did they all just kind of burn and farm? Well, first of all, I mean, most of them did. And it's not because they're bad people. Right. They had guests. They were just making a living. Yeah, and, living. Um, and what did you do in the 19th century? You farmed. Mm -hmm. Even if there wasn't enough good farmland around the farm. I'm just wondering if there but were yeah. forward thinking people. Yeah, there were. Um, yeah, we kill all the trees. I, mean, I mentioned the hunters, and many of them came from farming families. <coughs> the McDermott's, the Kennedys, local families uh, cared a lot, cared enough to invest their own money, to go into the schools and convince young elementary school kids to plant trees, mm -hmm. um, to plant the forest over by the waterworks also. Which was a Rotary Club in the 4-H project. The um, so those are farming families at Lime Hollow. The Baldwins, um, you know, they weren't necessarily conservationists per se, but I've seen one piece of evidence that um, one of the younger Baldwins bought several thousand saplings from the state of New York for planting. I don't know if he planted them at Lime Hollow or somewhere else, but. Um, that's that's a sign that he recognized the problem and wanted to do something about it. Um, the Fuller, the Donald Fuller farm, uh, which partly is now Lime Hollow, I mentioned that wildlife refuge, that the pond mm -hmm. that we call Baldwin Pond, mm -hmm. sometimes is referred to as a beaver pond. Mm -hmm. um, that was built because that landowner cared about ducks and deer, partly because he wanted to hunt them, but also because he wanted 
we wanted to help preserve the local <coughs> wildlife and encourage it in the area. Um, so yeah, I think there are, and that's one reason I want to tell the story of Lime Hollow. It's not just a sad, depressing story of destruction, <laughs> but locals, not just Washington, <coughs> D.C. or Albany, but locals are leading the way, whether it's Fuller and Baldwin, or it is Osborne from Auburn, um, or it's the Hunters, the Sportsmen Association. They're leading the way because uh, they see a problem and they're trying to, they care, they love this place, and they want, they want to fix it. So I, and that's, in some ways, that's maybe the most important story to tell, so that um, their grandkids uh, and the people who go to Lime Hollow uh, think this is not just something that people in Albany care about, or DC, or those bourgeois folks at the college care about, but my family who lived here cared about this. And so if there is a plaque or a guide to Lime Hollow and you're going through and you see, hey, local hunters helped create this preserve in their own way. Maybe environment, climate change is something that does matter to me. Um, and not just to those New York City liberals. Um, you know, I'm joking about that. But, 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 but telling that story may be a way to convince people who don't think about the environment to think about it. There's something about love of the land that their families also had. Because they, they've been caring about it for a long time. And hopefully they'll keep caring about it. Thank you to Dr. Miranda and thank you to all of you for coming.